this is really the beginning of school because uh, now we have clear sailing until uh, I guess Thanksgiving. We're off a little bit, but it's uh, with the Yom Tovim things get chopped, and uh, now this God will have uh, unabated learning with the students, and we can also have uh, hopefully learn on. Um, so also we're beginning the uh, cycle of the uh, Torah again, now in Parshas Noach. It really is a sense of beginnings. Last week's Parsha was Parsha's Bresh, as we talked about the creation of the world, the creation of man. At some level, this week's Parsha, we have a, a new creation. It was really, this is uh, version two. You know, version one pretty much didn't seem to make it that well. And so we have version two. We're going to see what kind of messages we can learn from version two. The idea I'm going to speak about, I might have spoken about this before, but I think it's really, really a, one of the most important aspects to raising our children with a healthy disposition, not, not only about themselves, but I think about Yiddishkeit. I mean, the thing that most of us struggle with today is in addition to making sure that our children are socially, emotionally well balanced, but we don't feel in many cases that that connection to the religion is there. To tackle perhaps one aspect of why that perhaps, why we're losing that battle. I mean, it's the, about, um, about five years ago already, there was a study that came out called the Pew Study. I'm not sure people got a chance to look at it. It was, uh, it was published in the New York Times. And they spent millions of dollars on doing a census as to where, where we are as Jews today living in the United States. So it involved a, a huge amount of data. But some of the studies, some of the comparing it to the last time it was done, was, was quite shocking in terms of the attrition of uh, the, the high rates of intermarriage and you know, people that are feeling connected, people that are going to identify with any type of synagogue, temple, and, and it just the attrition rate was, was really through the roof. One stat that just stuck out at me was that, according to the Pew study, and again, just take it for it at face value. It says basically, it said one out of four Jews living in the United States today have a Christmas tree on Christmas. It's a shocking statistic. Because we're not talking about, okay, I keep kosher, I don't keep kosher. We're not talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, riding, driving to Shul on Shabbos, not driving to Shul. We're talking about a Christmas tree. And that's of the people that were able to poll that identify themselves as Jewish. You know, who's, who knows even how many people are out there today that don't even identify themselves. So that's, it is true that out of all these streams, conservative, reform, orthodox, out of all the streams, the largest growth or the least amount of attrition is happening in the orthodox those who identify themselves orthodox, but we're not impervious to the attrition as well. There is a higher rate of people leaving the fold, whether it's intermarrying or not being, you know, you know not being observant anymore, you know, uh, also higher than before. So there is, you know, we can't just, oh, you know, we got it right. We don't have it right. And you'll speak to any educator today, anyone involved with children, you know, we, there's a huge concern. Where is that passion? Where is that uh, connection that might have existed perhaps in previous generations we don't see as much today? And that's, why aren't the kids davening like they used to daven before? Why aren't it, say... So, let's see, uh, you know, we're not going to have all the answers, but I want to touch on one area that I believe for sure, is a contributing factor that if we understand this as parents, that we can mitigate and we can help change. As a lead into today's year, we didn't get a chance to meet over the Yom Tovim, but I want to share with you an idea because I think it touches on the same uh, points. 
Motzi Yom Kippur, after, when I was in yeshiva, so learning as a student in Miami, so we would all gather together and uh, we, yeshivas end on Yom Kippur and they go all the way to Rosh Chodesh. I mean, Rosh Chodesh now, Rosh Chodesh Cheshvan is when the yeshivas start again. So you have a large break. Right? It's basically a, a month. Most yeshivas, boys are from all over the country, all over the world. And so this was like the last the message that the yeshiva would give us before we went back to our respective communities. I remember one year in particular. So the yeshiva gave us the following idea, told us the following idea. He said that there is a medrash, medrash tanchuma, we're all, we all have encountered at some point, that discusses the arba minim, the four species. And the medrash says that each one of the dalad minim represent a certain type of Jew. So you have, at the highest level, you've got the esrog, which has both taste and smell. Still waiting for somebody to make me a decent esrog that I, uh, but there, there are people that know how to make an esrog that tastes good, right? You know, taste, esrog taste, and a little liqueur, there's esrog liqueur. But anyway, that it has a good taste and it has a good smell. It represents Jews that have within them both Torah and they have Meisim Tovim, mitzvos. That's the all-rounded Jew. Then you have a Jew that only has Torah, but doesn't have Meisim Tovim, doesn't have the mitzvahs. And that is compared to, I believe it's the Lulav. The Lulav has taste, the dates, Talked about that for a moment. We don't eat lulavim, but it has taste, but it does not have fragrance. On the flip side, you have Jews that have mice and tovim, do a lot of chesed or mitzvahs, but they don't really have Torah, and that would be the hadasim. Hadasim. Some people actually use the hadasim for besamim. You know, after that, they take the hadas and they use it for besamim. It's uh, fragrant, but doesn't have taste. And then you have the bottom of the barrel, right? You have those Jews that are the Arava, that have no Torah and they have no Maisim Tovim. And the message of Sukkot has to be, we bind it all together. We bring them all together, and the notion of bringing them together then that's when HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Pore Sukkah Shalom. He brings his Sukkah of peace upon us. Va'al kol Yisrael. That's when all the Jews are together. Then God gives us the full blessing. If we're able to figure out how a way to bind everybody together, come together. Beautiful message. That's the message. I actually had an insight this year, which I never thought of before. But it's interesting is that we know on Hoshana Rabbah, Shana Rabbah is a, is, it's, it's from the Nevi'im. It's a festival of the Nevi'im they instituted because in the Beis HaMikdash, they would take Hoshanas. Hoshanas are the Aravas, and they would walk around the Mizbeach with them or circle them around the Mizbeach, and it had its own dedicated Yontav. It's only on the uh, sixth day of Sukkot. So I thought it was very interesting is that you make the, they made a Takana using the Arava. The Arava is the one that doesn't have anything. It's not Torah and Mitzvah. So the idea that I came up with is once you're able to bring all the Jews together, even the Arava is going to have its own Yanta. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the uh, symbolism of it. That you bring them all together, you empower them, that you'll, we can even make a Yanta from the Arava. Uh, that was the message. But anyway, but that's the measure. So, but my Rashiva asked a question. As the Gemara says, in uh, this is in Shabbos and in Mount Cotton, it says an interesting thing. We know that Rahman al Tzlan, a person loses a relative, so there is an obligation to do kriya. Kriya is they have to rent, tear their garment, depending if it's a parent or it's a sibling or it's a child. Rahman al Tzlan, there's different ways how you tear on the right side, or the left side, but you have to tear your garment. But it's usually it's a relative. It's part of expressing and internalizing the pain that 
we're feeling as part of the mourning process. But there's a fascinating Gemara, it says that if you are at Yitzhiyas Neshama, the departing of a soul, somebody is dying and you're there at the moment, at time that he dies, of any Jew, there's an obligation to do Kriya. Nowadays, there's actually discussion I saw in the commentaries because especially you have doctors, you have people like, what are you going to every day get a new suit? I mean, it's like, so there's a question of how it's done today or if it's done, whatever it is. But that, the Gemara says, I'll pee the dinner of the Gemara. You're there at the time, the Yitzhiyas Neshama of any person, that's it, any Jew. And Rashi says like this, the learned in Rashi says, because ain't kol echad be echad mi Yisrael, there is no Jew that's not male maisim tovus, mitzvahs of maisim tovus kerimon. Genetically, our genetic DNA, every Jew is full of good deeds like a pomegranate has seeds. Therefore, every Jew, you buy that, you have, you, have, you have to do Kriya. Loss of every, any Jew, you have to do Kriya. You're there, you have to do it. So the question is obvious. My Rashi said it's against the Medrash. The Medrash says there's the Arova. You have an Arova, which is no Maisim Tovim, no Torah. And yet Rashi says that the reason why I have to decree about every Jew, because every Jew is Malam Mitzvah's Kirimon. How could you say every Jew is Malam Then how could there be the Arova? Who's the Arova? Who's the question that he posed? I'll tell you the idea, because it's going to tie into something we're talking about today. He said it's very interesting when you're talking about compar- comparing the Dalit Minim to different segments of the Jewish community. It's in terms of taste and fragrance has good taste, has good fragrance. Why is that the comparison? So you say like this, you said that what's unique about something that has taste or has fragrance, you want more of it. Something has a good taste, you want to have some more. Something has good fragrance, you want to be around it. So what he suggested was that maybe there's different caliber or there's different quality of doing mitzvahs and studying Torah. We know that for ourselves. Not everybody that does mitzvahs, or not everybody that studies Torah, you want to be around. Sometimes that people come off in a very negative way. Right? Sometimes that people come across in a very judgmental way. Sarcastic, cynical, judgmental. Those aren't qualities you want to be around. So what the Torah is telling you is that the esrog is if you're full with Torah and mitzvahs of the quality that has a good taste and that has a good smell. Yes, it's possible that every Jew is full of good deeds because that's our DNA, our DNA. But that doesn't mean that it's of the caliber and the quality that it gives over the message that you want to be around that person. So he turned to us. He says, you know what? We all think, you know, we study in yeshiva, we do mitzvahs, we all think we're the esrog. We could be the arova. Because if the Torah that we are giving off and the mitzvahs that we're giving off is not one of a quality that's got tam v'reach, then you might, you yeshiva boys, we all might still be the arova, we might not be the esrog. So the message he says, you're going back to your communities now. The worst thing that could happen is when yeshiva boys come back to their communities and the communities don't get a positive feeling from what you've been doing back in the yeshiva. If it comes across as negative, it comes across as judgmental, and your families that have sent you there now are dealing with, with you in a, and you're dealing with them in a way that comes across cynical as, as, as negative, then you're all the Aravas. If you're going back home now, make sure you're going back as a srogan. You don't go back as our rovers. That was the, the message. It was a very powerful message, I thought, you're giving us. And I remember, I still remember that as a student. that had a tremendous impact on me. You know, unfortunately, you go down to, I, I see it, you know, I, I'm so because I was watching. You go to the shuls, and you see the yeshiva boys hanging out in the back, schmoozing, and you know, you know people are looking to you to determine direction for themselves, for their children, you got to come across in a way that that's what I want. That's not what I want, and they're not giving it over. Then the quality and the caliber of what you're doing is not at the point that God wants. That's not fragrance, that's not taste. That was the message, a very powerful message. Okay, let's talk about Parshas Noah, because I believe this is going to find you. You can learn a Parsha 
many, many times. And there's certain things you just miss and you don't see, and then when you see it, you say, how could I ever miss that? Right? The, the, the beauty of doing Shnai Mikrech Targum, that we do the, a review of the Torah, the Parsha, every week, is because you get new insights. You just get new insights. This is something, I have spoken about this before, but I think just a beautiful, beautiful message. And as I said, I think it's just fundamental in terms of what we want. How do we get our children to be the Esrog? Noah spends a hundred years building this table, which is supposed to be to save mankind. And also to avoid having the marble. There should not be the deluge. This would be the talking point. Why am I doing this? Because if we don't change our ways. You know, right? At the end of the day, he fails. The, the, part, the Haftorah of the week calls it May Noah. It calls it, the flood is the waters of Noah. He's held accountable. It's like his fault. Noah goes on the Teva, takes with him his three sons, his wife, and his daughter-in-laws. That's, that's all he saves. However, they start the new world order. They go a year on the Teva, man changes, man transitions, the things that affect man, this process of going on the, on the, on the ark has an impact. Man becomes a vegetarian, it goes from being a vegetarian to being able to eat meat coming off the Teva. Very interesting, that, that change happens. In, in, in on the table as well. Until then, Adam was not allowed to eat, eat meat. And then we talk about the dividing up the children. There's three of them. They all have their own children, grandchildren. They live to uh, ages in the 500, 600, 700. So they, uh, and they have large, large families. families. The 70 nations of the world come from the children of Noah. That's why the generic name that we use for man outside of Jew, if they're Jewish, is what is Ben Noah. Someone's Ben Noah, because Ben Noah, that's the generic name for a Noahide. That's because they come from Noah. Everyone comes from Noah. Look at this Pasuk, right? That brings down. Pasuk talks about one of the descendants of Noah, whose name was Ashur. Right in the middle, when it talks about the nations and how they band together to build the Tower of Bavel, it says that Usher left to a different place, and he goes to a place that he builds and names after his child, he calls it Ninveh. It's one of the descendants of Shame. Pasagir Aleph. So it says like this, Umina aret sahu yatsa Ashur. But Ashur left that land, Rashi says, what does it mean from that land? So what happens? There is this dynamic individual whose name is Nimrod. And this Nimrod is able to convince everybody that we need to build this tower of Bavel and they're from Midrashim, to fight against God, to separate against God, but basically he's giving over very negative messages. He's Gibor Chayel, he's a mighty warrior against God. So, Rashi says like this, Kevin Shira Ashur, as Banav, Shomin le Nimrod, they saw that his children were being affected by this Nimrod, they were starting to listen to him. Umaridim Bamakum Livnos Amigda, and they were rebelling against God to build this tower. Yatsami Tocham, we can't stay here. The influences of these people are too great, bad influences. Let's leave. So, where does he leave? He goes and he builds the city of Ninveh. That's where he, his descendants, go. Fast forward, we all read the Haftorah on Yom Kippur of Yonah, and Yonah is instructed to go tell the people of Ninveh that because they are so evil, the city is going to be destroyed. It's very hard to understand. Ninveh is created by Ashur running away, not wanting to be influenced by the evil Nimrod, and yet it ends up being Rayim Bechatoim. It puts them on the level of Zdom. That becomes worse. 
We don't even see that terminology used about the people in Bavel, and yet that's the terminology that used in Nimrod. It even come out worse. And not only that, the Medr says that when Yonah got them to do tshuva, it really was temporary. At the end, Nineveh was completely destroyed. Which means that the outcome of the descendants of Ashur was even worse, and the, re- and the punishment was even worse, than what the outcome of what happened with Nimrod and the people that were there. And yet he was trying to do a good thing. He was trying to run away from evil. He didn't want his kids being influenced by the evil Nimrod. That's what Rashi says. That's what Yatsa and the Pasuk tells us. Yatsa Misham. So Asher was not an Asher, this Asher was not a simple person. He obviously had sensitivities. Not only that, what language is the Sefer Torah written in? Ksav Ashuris. It's Ashur, Assyrian script. That sensitivity was, he failed. His children destroyed. We're trying to get them away. They become even worse. How does that work? There's a Svorna at the end of Bracious, last week's Parsha. So my Roshiva showed me the Svorna. Unbelievable Svorna. The Svorna asked the question. It's only he was shown him commentaries in the Mikros Gedolos. He says, how is it possible? Or why, why is it? Not how is it possible. Why is it contrasting the impact that Avram had on humanity to that of what Noah had on humanity. Avram is the father of monotheism. Avram, from him comes all monotheistic religions, all the Judaic Christian values, all of the value comes from Avram Avinu. Impact is huge. Noah, Noah believed in God. Noah studied Torah, Rashi says. He knew kosher animals from the non-kosher animals. Yet, what impact does he have on the world? He can't get more than seven people onto the boat. A hundred years. That's all he can do. The world gets destroyed. It's called the waters of Noah because of his inability, the, in, the lack of impact that he has. And yet, Avram starts this tremendous Kiruv movement. Avram has an impact on the whole world. Av Hamon Goyen. Anybody stopped by, was touched by him, started believing. What did Avram do right and what did Noah do wrong? That's the Sephora wants to know. She says like this, the message of Noah was, I'm building this Teva. If you don't change, you guys are going to die. The message was a negative message. People will not change from a negative message. Avram, Avram is imitating HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Mahu Rachum, Avatar Rachum, compassion. Mahu Machnis Orech, he's Machnis Orech. All of the positive qualities of what Yiddishkeit has to offer coming through from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Avram Avinu, that's what he offered. When you're offering a positive message, then everybody wants to buy in. When the message is a negative message, you do this, you're going to get this. You're going to... Nobody wants to divide. No how one wants to divide. What's that? So how is this family? Yeah, I guess he had enough influence on his kids and his wife still. He was able to still force them. I don't know, but he, that, but everybody else wasn't able to do. That's the problem with Asher. Asher, we can't be around these people. You can't be around these people. We've got to go somewhere else. It means all you're offering of the message is what you cannot be around, what you cannot do, who you can't be. If it's all coming from that type of a message, a negative message, not only are you not going to protect your children from the negative, but what happens? They become out even worse. Unless it can come across as a positive message, you're not going to be successful, and in fact, it's going to be more detrimental. And that, to me, that is such a huge insight into what we need to be doing with our children. How is Yiddishkeit coming across to our children? Is Shabbos about the beauty of Shabbos? Or is Shabbos about what you're not allowed to do? And you can't, you can't use your phone, you can't use your computer, you can't do this, you can't do that. What is the message? I had a Rebbe when I was learning in Kol Torah in, in Bait Vagan, Rabbi Shmuel Deutsch. Shmuel Deutsch is one of the great minds in Eretz Yisrael today, really brilliant Talmud Chacham, him and his brother. He was Rabbi Yitzchak Deutsch. 
Somebody once asked of Shach. Shach was a, he, he was actually a full was a student of Shach in Panovich. Rav Shach, unfortunately, his two children, his two sons, did not follow the path that the father had wanted for them. Rabbi Shmuel Deutsch, his father was the curator, who was the janitor in Ponovich. So someone asked, I don't have the audacity to ask that, he asked Rosh Hashanah, how is it possible that you, the Rosh Yeshiva, did not have your children follow in your path, and yet the janitor of Ponovich is two of the greatest Talmud Chacham in Yerushalayim today. How is that possible? What do you answer? Illuminating answer. He says, at my Shabbos table, all I did was say over Divrei Torah. We studied Torah, we studied. At his Shabbos table, they sang Smiris. Very powerful message. Are we promoting the beauty? Or is it all just about rules and regulations and punishments? What you can't do and what happens if you do? And as his parents, and who you're allowed to play with and who you're not allowed to play with and what's wrong with what they're doing? That's Usher. Ninveh. The takeaway from today is number one, the only way to make it work is if there's a positive message. Now we can't throw out the rules and regulations. It's not about all kumbaya. They are specific rules and regulations, but it has to be brought forth in a positive way. And I think it ties into what we said in the beginning of the class is that the impact that you're going to have on people is are you coming forth? Are you the Esro? Is what you're doing, do people want what, you, what you're selling? Do they want to be part of what it is that you are promoting? Positivity, the taste and the fragrance. But if the taste and the fragrance are not there for them to buy into, they're not buying in and only that, it actually has a, it pushes away, doesn't bring close.